People have been forgetting to introduce themselves with their fun fact, and I, I am the initial offender of that. So my fun fact is that um, I'm actually, if you knew me prior to Lennox-Gastel syndrome, I am a um, extreme introvert. But I am actually really pissed off at LGS. So I am now uh, an extrovert in one area of my life, and it's this. Uh, so thanks a lot, LGS. One more thing you make me do that I don't want to do. And the first time I gave a public speaking talk, you have to ask Heather Mefford, um, I threw up in the planter behind the curtain because I was so nervous. So with that, Dr. Lugos, Dennis, <laughs> come on up. Don't forget your fun fact. All right, thank you, Tracy, and thanks for the invitation to speak and for everyone that uh, is responsible for this very important meeting. All right, my fun fact, there's actually two. Um, I have two nephews that are in bands, and I would like you to know about them. The first, my nephew Adam, is the lead singer in an indie pop band called Sub Radio. They're really good, catchy tunes. They're playing in Washington in early November. My other nephew, Ben, is the guitarist in a heavy metal band based in Baltimore. They are the screamo genre of heavy metal. <laughs> and um, they just posted a video on Spotify, and it's something like the thrashing death grind from the hollows of Baltimore. <laughs> so if you like indie pop, sub radio, something a little coarser, eye catcher. Those are my fun facts. All right. So, thank you for the manageable talk, because I'm going to talk about the current state of affairs, which is largely, from a drug approval point of view, a story of success. From a patient point of view, maybe incremental improvements. But from a regulatory point of view, how we currently conduct clinical trials has worked. I'm going to focus on the drugs that are already approved. There are at least three, maybe four, trials in progress, but some of those will be addressed by subsequent speakers. My disclosures and our learning objectives, we're gonna go through quickly the components of any randomized clinical trial for epilepsy. Then we'll look at some of the inclusion, exclusion, important points about LGS trials since 1993, starting with felbamate. And we're gonna, I'm going to take you up to the end of the fenfluramine study. And then we'll discuss some points open for debate, discussion, sticking points, ways to maybe improve a little bit the trial design. So it is remarkable that any of these trials succeed. It, they are all imperfect compounds with a difficult heterogeneous disease. This slide summarizes some of the things that an anti-seizure medicine has to deal with. And you see them from etiology to drug target alterations to genetic factors, inflammation. It's remarkable that the drugs work, yet they do in randomized clinical trials, despite all of the limitations that you've heard about. So the quick 35,000 foot view of a clinical trial is first you have to define a patient population. Then what's your exposure or your intervention? The things I'm gonna talk about have all been drugs. Those have been the interventions. You heard about the DBS trial, which was a device intervention. Maybe there'll be more. But if you have a drug, you have to figure out a dose, which is frankly a guesstimate early on, and then a titration schedule, which could be, could be slow or could be long. Your outcomes, you've heard about the flaws with seizure frequency outcomes. The bottom line with seizure frequency outcomes is counting perfectly is impossible. The goal is to count consistently throughout all phases of the trial. Then the design. So in the US, a pathway to an anti-seizure medicine approval requires a study with randomization, blinding, and comparison to a concurrent control group. Now that concurrent control group does not have to be a placebo arm. You can do an active control, but if you do, you make it harder for your novel compound to succeed. So all of the studies we're going to talk about used placebo as the concurrent control group. 
And I know there are many problems with that design. I think the reality is, in the near term, the need for a concurrent control group is not going to go away. Um, so I think that's just a, a fact I think we have to face. It, it is a rigorous measure, but we want new treatments to face a rigorous measure. So the phases here are screening, baseline, the intervention is given, or you're in the control group, and then the outcome is measured. So we're going to look at a couple of flow charts of studies, but before we do, all of the studies that I'm going to talk about, and I think the studies ongoing now, have used these recent past definitions of LGS. And you see some of the highlights in red. Age of onset, one to eight years. Cognitive impairment, nearly universal. Um, multiple seizure types with tonic and atypical absence being the most common. And then the EEG. Now, I'm going to spend a little more time on EEG here than you might think because Currently in trials, the EEG is a bit of a pain point, depending on how you define it. It is a fundamental feature of Lennox-Gasto, but it limits uh, patients who are eligible just due to logistical factors. The EEG that the study requires is simply not always available. So that's one factor we have to deal with sort of going forward. So in 2022, the ILAE redefined LGS. I should say that this categorization and all of the ILAE syndrome categories are for clinical purposes. This is not meant to be the inclusion criteria of the next LGS trial. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. So you can take this with a grain of salt. Clinically, I think it's useful. So the, the significant changes, really the one significant change is under age of onset toward the bottom, less than 18 years. Now you've heard and I agree that it is uncommon for LGS to present at 15 or 16 years, but given this expanded definition, they are now part of the uh, LGS syndrome. And then under EEG, this tabular form says slow spike in wave, and generalized paroxysmal fast activity, or GPFA, and it doesn't say and or or. The text says and, meaning both. You have to have both evidence of slow spike and wave and GPFA to meet criteria. The table sort of leaves that open to, oh, is it one or the other? But the text says and. That will make things more challenging going forward. But like I said, this is for clinical purposes and does not have to define inclusion criteria in a trial. So here's slow spike and wave. Uh, for those of you that are not uh, EEG ears, the vertical lines are one second, and you basically see two spikes and two slow waves between each second. Two hertz spike and wave. All right, here's the study diagram, which is really where I want to spend time. This happens to be the Clobazam study design, but all of them were more or less the same. Now, this design starts with baseline. You'll see a slide in a slide or two that includes the screening phase. So know that there is a screening phase that precedes baseline. But so the typical study, baseline, four weeks, titration three weeks, which is either to active drug or in this case placebo, maintenance 12 weeks. So we have 19 weeks, four plus three plus 12, where the challenge is nothing else can change. Your current treatments must remain fixed. That's a problem for patients that are having daily, weekly seizures. But that's the way it's been in all of the trials. And some of the baseline periods might be six weeks. There are studies that talk about the need for an eight-week baseline. So one big challenge is the duration of time where nothing else can change other than the intervention or the control group, which is typically uh, placebo. The baseline phase, I think, is particularly frustrating because literally nothing is happening. There is no novel drug. There is no placebo that the clock is 
nothing changes. So anyway, th this, is, this is the basic design. This is our other EEG snapshot, generalized paroxysmal fast activity. Uh, so you have slow spike and wave, and you have GPFA. Now, this is from the fenfluramine study, and I included this because it also added the screening period. So what else can be troublesome to families, patients, sites, sponsors, is stuff that happens in screening. So look at the fenfluramine data. 335 patients were screened. 72 were excluded at screening for various reasons there, including you know, didn't meet LGS criteria or didn't have enough seizures or some other concomitant therapy. So that's difficult. You know, the, the families engage, they're interested, the site, and then screen failures. So that's another challenge in the trials. And then the study proceeded very much like the Clobazam trial with a baseline, a titration, randomization, et cetera. So here are the seven drugs with FDA approvals, and you've seen this list twice already. And uh, something changed with the Clobazam trial. Notice that felbamate, as Dr. Worrell said, the felbamate inclusion, the felbamate outcomes were in some way the most rigorous. So the first study back in 1993, you've got a seizure diary plus a sample of video EEG. That has not been repeated. And then Clobazam came along with the definition of drop seizure, which Elaine showed. And drop seizure has just been kept since then with varying definitions. But that's one of the things we'll talk about in the what can we do differently, because what drop seizure means a lot of different things. So what is up? for debate when looking back at these trials or when thinking about the trials that are in progress or when planning the next trial. So the first, the primary outcome seizure type. I think an advance with some of the trials that are in progress is they are taking an honest look at this term drop seizure can we either define it differently or can we just use a different term? I think one, one option that I think has made things at least a little bit clearer is rather than this fall potential or risk of fall is what body parts are involved. You can have atonic seizures that are isolated to loss of head and neck tone. That is an atonic seizure. There is no risk of fall. It is hard to count. So if you focus on body parts, does the tonic or atonic seizure affect the trunk or legs? That is, I think, one simple thing that might add a little bit of clarity. Major motor drop seizure, what does that mean? Now we're using two unofficial terms. We major motor seizure, that's not official. Drop seizure is not official. Uh, but that includes the broader seizure types, GTCs, focal with bilateral, tonic-clonic. Those would be your major motor, plus you have your drops, however they choose to define it. So there is some simple, I think, adjustments that can be made to that definition. EEG criteria, every, so the, the current studies have, have used or. Uh, they, they've either used you must have slow spike and wave, present or past, and then GPFA is not relevant. I think one trial has either one, slow spike and wave or GPFA, which was a boost to inclusion. That helped a lot. No, none of the trials currently, I think, are using and, where you must have both. And it's mainly an issue with older patients, because pediatric patients will find evidence rather quickly of both of those EEG patterns. But when you move on to older patients with huge unmet needs, it can be hard to actually find the data. So I think, frankly, we spend too much time quibbling over the EEG details of Lennox Gastel. And I realize that is heresy for syndrome purists, but it really hurts uh, the practicality and clinical relevance of trials. The length of baseline, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, always up for debate. How long is the placebo exposure? That's a key point. 12 weeks is standard and has worked for seizure frequency outcomes. It probably will not work for developmental or non-seizure outcomes, but we'll talk about uh, during the panel, I hope, some of the novel ways that are being considered 
to retain the manageable blinded phase, but still have a way to measure a developmental outcome, developmental outcome in the extension phase. And then atypical patients, tonic, atonic seizures, all of the epileptiform EEG criteria, but normal EEG background. By the, are they in or out? Or normal cognition. Everything else okay, but there that you have neuropsych testing. It's in the the typical range. So things like that, and then the big elephant in the room is they don't have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome by anybody's definition, but they have treatment-resistant tonic, atonic, and probably other seizure types. They are locked out right now of trials, uh, and uh, I think you'll hear from a subsequent speaker about how that can be approached. Um, where the seizure type uh, is more of the emphasis than the syndrome. So these are some of the forward-looking ways. So we have a well-worn path, a, a series of copycat studies that have been successful, but can we do better? And I think, yes, we can, and I'm looking forward to the discussions, and thank you for all of these that have uh, made this talk possible. Thank you. <clears throat>